is Dina Does. I'm Dina, and I know a little bit about a lot, but I want to know more. So join me on this path to self-discovery. Today on Dina Does, we're discussing pet loss. So um, we met, I want to introduce my guest today. We met on Instagram. Your Instagram handle is um, Pet Loss Psychologist. So you're an expert in pet loss and grief. Welcome, Dr. Katie Lawler. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm so honored to be here. And I'm truly sorry that we're meeting under these circumstances. Um, but I just, I thank you for having me today. Well, thank you for being here. When, when I, you know, I have, um, my following on social media is very interesting because a lot of people come from my different backgrounds, a lot of it from housewives, some of it from HDTV who are interested in design, but the one common thread I think we all have is, um, the love for animals. There are, I mean, so many people reach out. I've lost two animals in the span of, you know, these last two years and, I guess I could say I'm lucky enough that it's the first time I'm losing animals. So it's the first time I'm dealing with this, but it's also everyone in the household is getting old at once. So it's been one hit after another. Um, And I did, you know, everyone was like, yes, please have an expert on. We need to talk about this more. But I had to do some work on my own, some EMDR therapy on my own before I could even discuss it. Otherwise, I'd still be in a bucket of tears. (laughs) Of course. Yeah. So um, why don't you explain your background and how you got into um, this particular field? Sure, absolutely. So I hold a doctorate of clinical psychology from the PGSP Stanford PsyD Consortium. And, you know, growing up as the middle child, the awkward sister of three girls, I I just always felt more comfortable in the presence of of animals and really felt that I could be my genuine, authentic, introverted self around them. And I started to realize that, that when they pass away, there's not enough attention and there's not enough comfort and healing around the process. And when I was in grad school, I really tried to um, examine all of our grief protocols for humans in the lens of pet loss. And and here we are. I just truly think that this topic does not get the attention and the research that it deserves. Absolutely. And it's hard to articulate how different the loss of a pet is from a loss of a human. And sometimes I hate to say it out loud because the people who don't connect to animals the way we do can't understand what animals are to us. And the same, I mean, I communicate with animals so much better than I communicate with humans. (laughs) (laughs) And um, they truly are, especially the pets that choose us as their owners, um, are a part of us in different ways. So I, when I lost Gracie, who was my two-legged chihuahua and um it was something I wasn't prepared for and I had lost my dad a few months before which was horrific because it was during COVID and I had to say goodbye to him on Zoom and there were so many levels of grief there but this was like my stomach was twisting I didn't understand like this visceral reaction I was having to this loss and it was again, like I didn't have anywhere to go. I felt because at this time I didn't find you yet. (laughs) And it was just um, something, although my husband's an animal lover, I don't think he connects to them on the way that I do. So it was something that I felt very alone in my grief. Um, But, and we'll get into how different grandma wrinkles losses to Gracie and why. Um, But Gracie died the day before Christmas and I had to put on my Christmas face and I had guests coming over and my, and I didn't want to cancel everything because my daughter deserved a Christmas and my husband and everyone. And then we left on an already planned vacation that we had canceled because Gracie was sick. And when she died, my husband was like, we are going to Mexico and we're Mm going to drink tequila and we're going to just laugh and have fun. But I didn't give myself the proper space to grieve. I'm, I'm so glad that you're touching on this. So with our, our fellow humans, especially loved ones, you know, our relationships are complex as two human beings in a, in a relationship dynamic. And there's highs and lows, there's breakups, misunderstanding arguments. And, you know, our, our 
beloved companion animals, they're there for us on the worst days. They're there for us on the best days. And we really come to rely on their unconditional love and loyalty. So when they pass, it leaves a void like no other. Um, it's absolutely devastating. Yeah, that's what I felt was, and a friend of mine kind of said it in a text after grandma died, is like, it's us mere mortals. It's the little piece of unconditional love that we actually get to feel. Because like you said, in human love, there's always some conflict. There's always some wounds, you know, and even though our animals sometimes come to us with abusive backgrounds, especially rescues and stuff, they're so forgiving and so loving. And they teach us as humans how to forgive and how to love. Um, you know, I often say, and I've said it several times that my little mama and every animal, like I'm sure children, I only have one human child, but I have several animal children, but I could relate to when they say, you know, which one do you love the most? They're all very different. And my animals as well, as well but it's different. It's like the part of me, they all represent a part of me um, and a part of my healing journey and a part of my beauty and a part of my grace, my little grace, that was her name. Um, so that's why like you feel it on really such a gut wrenching level because you're experienced parts of you that are leaving. I, I just, the way you just articulated that was so beautiful. And I, I really do think that the animals who come into our lives are, are meant to be there for one reason or another. And we're just so able to be our genuine authentic selves around them and they love us for that mm -hmm. and I think that's why that bond is so deep and special and you know you said there are some people that just aren't animal lovers and they just don't get it and in a way my heart goes out to them because they'll never understand that connection right yeah and you know when Gracie died I think it's Winnie the Pooh who said like because the love like that is so deep, the loss is so deep. There's there's mm -hmm. actually a little phrase that says that so grateful to love this much to hurt this much, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's what my I think all animals do for all of us. So I mm -hmm. want to touch on um when to know to let go, because again, I communicate with animals on a different level that I'm sure a lot of people out there do. I would got very clear messages from Gracie and Grandma Wrinkles when it was time. Um, but for those of us who out there who may not have that animal connection, because we're all different, that's what makes the world go round. Um, I was able to hear very clearly it's time. Mm -hmm. There was a little bit of struggle with grandma wrinkles because she went from being completely fine to something happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I brought her to the vet. And again, my husband is so amazing in this way. He's like, don't even worry about the cost, whatever it costs, let's figure it out. And he's very different with me where he wants to stay alive himself to the last second. He doesn't matter if, who's with, mm -hmm. I'm, I don't want that. If I'm not living, I don't right. want to be alive. Oh. And because I feel that way, that's what I feel for my animals. Like I don't want them to suffer for an ounce. I don't want my other animals to suffer watching them because there's bonding, you know, with them as well. Um, so my, my advice, I guess, to people who aren't like animal communicators is to listen to your vet, but listen to your gut more. Playlists help me. Like when I was kind of struggling, is she ready? She told me like, when is it coming? I put a playlist on when I asked the question, I think there was a song on that said like, take me home and, or something like that. And that was the message I got. So to look for signs through other things. Do you have any advice on this? So I, I'm a huge believer in signs and I hope we come mm -hmm. back to that. But I, again, I think you really named it. Gentle reminder, you are the expert on your pet. You've, you've lived your life with them together. And this is why I think it's so important to have a trusting relationship with your vet because they can really guide you and advise you at least from the medical clinical side. And, you know, the two vets that I work with, um, Dr. Lisa Lippman and Dr. Monica Tarantino, they really do stress better a day too soon than a day too late 
because of the suffering. And I think that if your pet's quality of life, just like you said, their well-being, if you're putting that first and you're really examining their quality of life and how they're living, you can't, you can't make a mistake. You know, I, I hear all the time, oh, but what if, or did I do this wrong? No, if you, if your pet's well-being was front and center, you can't, you can't make a mistake. Yeah. There's a lot of guilt that comes along with making that decision as well. But like you said, it's better sooner than later. And sometimes we don't want to see, when I look back at videos of Gracie Mm -hmm. and how sick she was, I couldn't even see it because I didn't want to see it. Exactly. And had I been able to look through a lens that was not, it was a little bit selfish because I wasn't ready to let her go because it was my first animal. I didn't know what was happening. She was diagnosed with bladder cancer, which is very rare in dogs, especially a chihuahua. And even the vets were kind of confused. Like this doesn't usually happen with chihuahuas, but because she was inbred and she only had two legs, Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was something else going on inside of her. Um, So anyway, there's just so many layers to it and the guilt needs to be removed because you're doing it in their best interest. You're doing it because you have compassion and you don't want them to suffer. And it's so much better to be able to be with them and make it a ceremonial process of them leaving this earth because they gave you the gift of so much throughout their years. Like you said, unconditional love. They're there for us no matter what, licking our tears away, just being connected to us in so many different ways. We owe them, in my opinion, to make the process of them leaving beautiful and painless. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's so much worse to walk in and so much more traumatic to walk into a dead animal that you've just kept alive because you weren't ready. Well, I'm so glad that you brought up the topic of guilt and that potential emergency or trauma situation. So when we lose a pet, especially if the loss was sudden, unexpected, or traumatic, as you said, we as humans, as their guardians, um, we really tend to blame ourselves, believe that we should have been able to stop their death from happening, and or we feel like we should have been able to behave differently in the moment. And so what happens is if we start having these thoughts, we start to develop emotions that correspond to these thoughts. And these aren't the natural emotions we would expect to feel when we lose our beloved pets, which would be, you know, loneliness, devastation, despair. Instead, what happens in in psychology, we, we refer to these as manufactured emotions. They're distorted feelings based on our personal interpretation of the pet's passing. So for example, if we believe that we should have been able to save this animal or do something else, then of course, we're absolutely going to feel guilt and shame and several other negative, horrible feelings about ourselves. And over time, what happens is the more that we continue to think about their passing through this lens the more trapped we're going to get in the guilt cycle. Um, So in other words, the more manufactured feelings we continue to have, the more just completely stuck in our guilt we're going to feel and possibly become depressed, anxious, and some other um, really have some really other clinical symptoms. So what do we do? Um, We can begin our healing by uh, changing the perception of our pet's passing by developing a more realistic recollection of of what actually happened. So to do this, we need to go back and remember our thoughts and our actions leading up to the passing exactly as they were. But most people don't want to do this because that's really painful, right? To go back to those days, those moments. But if you're able to ask yourself, you know, what was I thinking was best at the time? Or what information did I have? What resources did I have, including financial? Um, You know, could I have known this was going to happen? The hope is that you you will remember how much you did for your animal and how deeply you love them and that you did everything for them. And then gradually that guilt will will start to turn into self-compassion and understanding. And this goes for accidents um, where God forbid they get out, they get hit by a car, a coyote, you know, California, that happens a lot. 
um, there there is a spiritual level to all of this. And that's a whole nother layer of, of this where what's going on inside of you and showing yourself, like, are you traumatized by something else? Is, was there something going on before that chaos or what have you? But no matter what it is, always remember what that animal represented to you. And again, that's unconditional love, pure grace. There's always a lesson in it. Um, Grandma Wrinkle's last gift to me, and I mm. couldn't see this right away until I went to my EMDR therapy was it brought up so much grief that I thought I had processed wow. from my dad's death to my dog, Gracie, to my old life back in New Jersey. I never really properly grieved, you know, losing my home and my whole, you know, world there. Um, and it was like, what's happening? It was this rush of, of grief happening. And I felt kind of weird because I'm like, I'm just supposed to be sad that my cat died. What's going on? But after I unpacked it, <laughs> I realized that was her last gift to me is to mm -hmm. reveal what I had not yet processed in my healing journey. And how profound is that? Well, Dean, I mean, it's, it's so clear to me that you have done a tremendous amount of reflection and a tremendous amount of work. And I, I really want to point this out. So cognitively in your brain and your mind, you might be able to differentiate the losses. You, you know, you understand that this is a different loss from a previous animal or a human loved one, but the body and the heart, it just really, the grief does start to build up. It really exacerbates, you know, the, the, the heart perceives it as more, just more loss. And unless that's processed, unless you really go deep on it, the next loss is just going to bring up all these feelings and thoughts all over again. So I'm just, uh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was a wild ride in the MDR. I was like, where am I going? But her death specifically, Graham's death was so peaceful. And I have to say, I recommend um, if there is a company near you and there are all over the world mm -hmm. that specifically um, focus on helping your pet cross over. I had a wonderful lady come to the home. She actually was a previous vet um, that worked at the vet that I use. Um, her company, we'll put in the show notes if you're in California, Pacific at Home, I believe it's called. Her name was Annette, Dr. Annette Lepore. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she had my mom's name too, there was comfort to that. My mom is 3000 miles away and there was the spiritual meaning of that. But she spent time with us about an hour before we actually did it. And there was no limit going over the last vet records, going over what I felt it was gut wise, going over what my vet said, it turned out in the end that, you know, vets are not gods, they do make mistakes. And here I am poking this poor hairless cat with fluids the last few days that she didn't even need. Um, we felt in the end because of what was going on in her body and how she was breathing that she had some kind of rupture of a tumor that just metastasized throughout her body and her brain and everything. So she was lethargic, didn't have the signs of like the kidney failure that I was told she was in. Um, it would turn out to be something very different. Um, but the way she went through everything to assure me that it was her time, even though my gut told me it was to have that second technical opinion helped. Um, I am a very ceremonial person. So I already had the crystals ready and the flowers ready and the bed ready and the music on. If not, if you're not that kind of person, she did. She had a playlist that could be done. Again, music is so important. Whereas maybe that's the time you're driving in your car and you're feeling all sorts of ways and that song comes on and you're like, oh, thank you, grandma. Like you're here with me. Um, look for, for someone who specializes because Gracie's death was very different where I was in a panic. It was the day before Christmas. She wasn't eating anymore. She wasn't drinking. I had a vision of me being in an emergency ER parking lot Christmas day. And that was the last thing that I wanted for Gracie is to be somewhere. And we weren't allowed to go in these, this is 2020 where you couldn't go in the vet. And I had this vision of her or me in the parking lot. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that to her. So she would have lasted a few more days, you know, with droppers or whatever. But I was like, I got, I got to do this now. So my two vets came over and did it, but there was a catheter and it was chaotic a little bit, even though I had a ceremony and there was a lot of trauma that I didn't, mm -hmm address right away with that seeing the catheter go in because her legs were so skinny and all mm -hmm. but the difference between that and this woman that does this for a living only 
and is gives you a pamphlet to read about grief and loss afterwards. I just highly recommend that for those listening. <laughs> That's my tangent that I do. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think, and just like you said, if there is a way to make their passing as in line with your spiritual beliefs and what you think would bring both of you comfort and peace, then of course I, I would be in full support of that. And I know um, there is a rise of um, at death doulas that can really help you before and after and also vets that that specialize in, in um, really making what is undoubtedly going to be one of the worst days of your life just that much safer. And I do, um, I do just want to support, yeah, anyone that's going through that to get the, the comfort and the peace and the support that they need during that just completely vulnerable, devastating time. Exactly. So I just want to touch on, um, things we could do after the loss of a pet. Obviously, um, if you work with a therapist, that's, something that's smart to do just to flush out your feelings again maybe other things will come up and follow down that road um I, one of the things i always recommend and i do get a lot of inboxes of people saying especially after gracie died now grandma is like i am reeling i don't know what to do mm -hmm. and i remember the day both little mom i mean both gracie and grandma wrinkles the day they died like nothing was going to make me smile like i was right. just torn apart and little mama, who is my clown of the house, made me not only smile, but like laugh hysterically because she's got like this little baby rhino energy where she just runs around crazy. And it was just like that little moment. So having other pets is very important. I just actually, while I'm thinking about that, because yeah. again, we're not, we're not like a, a high production and I don't oh want it that way. Goodness. This is my kitchen counter. I wanted girlfriends talking about pet loss. Um, the one thing that also I can recommend from my experience now is when we were putting um, grandma to rest, I said, let's go do it in the courtyard because I don't want Ladybug to see it. Ladybug uh -huh. is her bonded sister. Ladybug is 18 months older than grandma. She's 16. Um, and I said, I don't want her sister to see it. And she was like, no, 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 no. She needs to understand too. And I didn't even think of that. I wanted to protect her because that's my way as a mama. Instincts, right, exactly. But she said, no, 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 she needs to understand this process. And this is where Graham was most comfortable on this couch with her. And she was like, and afterwards, we're gonna put her in the center of the room and allow Lady to approach her and sniff her and see, understand what's happening. Thank God she said that. Um, Ladybug's so aloof, she just walked away and she didn't. <laughs> but I can only imagine, and I don't even want to go there yet when little mama and G one of them goes before the other, because they're so bonded. That's a necessary step um, that I wouldn't even think of is your other animals are going to be grieving. They're going to be confused. So are, do you have any advice as far as that? I think again, trust your intuition, trust your instincts, trust your heart in this. And from a clinical perspective, I truly don't think we as humans have been able yet. Maybe the research is just starting to come out, but we truly don't realize how smart and intuitive animals are just because we haven't figured out a way to communicate with them. Um, I think we are just starting to see, we're just on the cusp of research that is going to show us how brilliant and caring and how uh, sentient they are. So I think exactly. I think in these cases, as with everything, you really, you know, you can make all the cognitive decisions. And yes, it's helpful to plan things out because that can lower anxiety on the day. Anxiety is really kind of fear of the unknown or what's going to happen. But in those moments, I mean, my most basic advice would be to, to really sink down into your body as much as you can and trust your heart, trust your intuition. You know your animals, you know what they need, and then do that for them. Yeah. And on that note, animals are the most healing thing, whether you're an animal communicator or lover. They are. I'm telling you, they are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I remember a girlfriend of mine lost her little chihuahua. That was her life. She had no children of her own by choice. Um, and she had this little dog and she was just like 
it was almost 20 years old. And she reached out and she was like, I don't even know what to do. And I gently told her because she didn't have any other animals. Why don't you foster? And she got so mm -hmm. mad at me. And I understand why she would get mad at me because like no one could replace her baby. But I, the thing about an animal is until they're in your presence, you don't understand how healing they are. And especially to foster, to give another chance to an animal in the system and um, help them as they're helping you. So eventually she did. And she said, I'm so sorry I got mad at you. She was like, not only is this animal healing me, but I'm keeping him. And she's like, he was sent to me by my other dog and I get it now. And so if you're of the mindset of nobody can replace my dog, I get that. Don't run out and get a new dog. I hate to say the word bye, but some people do. Adopt a new dog, foster first. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good advice that I gave um, a few people that inbox me. It's just like, why don't you foster? See what that feels like. Just, you know, be there for each other. And it is extremely healing. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think if you can go into the process with the understanding that no other animal is going to replace that the animal that you lost, I think that's the mindset because then you can kind of open your heart. You can be vulnerable about bringing in a new uh, pet into your home and your heart. Um, and I think that really, you know, if we, some people go out and they expect it to immediately kind of heal them, but I, I don't think that's possible. I think it just helps the scar tissue cover the wound and you gradually with the trust of both of you working together, um, you learn to love again. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. So share with me um, where we can get support community. Of course. So I think that is the most important thing when you go through this devastating process you need to be around people that absolutely get it and hopefully that does include loved ones but support groups can be an incredible way to get what you need following your loss it really validates what you're going through it, it allows you to ask for help it allows you to see what others have done and it, it has been shown, research has shown that engaging in support groups does improve your emotional and mental health following, following a loss. Um, so I would just encourage you to find a space where you feel like you can show up and say absolutely anything on your mind around people who get it and who have been there themselves. Exactly. And, uh, you know, like I said, some people, especially people within your home may not understand the connection that you had, it will be very different. So find that group, um, definitely follow you on Instagram, you have so oh, many great gosh, outlets. Thank you. Um, so your Instagram will put in all the show notes, but I really appreciate you being here and taking the time out. Um, and, you know, walking us through this process that has so many layers, we're going to do another podcast with grief in general, um, and where how it spreads the way I mentioned, and we're also going to have some pet communicators on soon too. So we're, we're covering it all. It's a very big dear topic to our following and we want to make sure that we give it the time um, that it really deserves. So thank you for being here. Oh, my we'll goodness. Have you back my on. Hopefully, not for this reason. Exactly. <laughs> I was just going to say, no, it truly has been a pleasure. And I just, I want to deeply thank you for highlighting this process because you clearly, you clearly understand. And I think you're helping so many people by being open to, to discussing it and opening up your heart. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Well, that's what Dina does is all about is healing from trauma and seeing the beauty and the joy in the process. So thank you for being here. And again, we'll see you next time, but not under these circumstances. Yeah. We'll just talk about <laughs> some fun stuff. It's a deal. Uh, all right. Take care. We'll see you. Thank you.